Hello. Hello. Welcome to another episode of Diverse Talk, connecting the dots between industries with perspective from personalities from around the globe. And welcome to Mark Onward to this edition of Diverse Talks. In this session, we're going to be covering the topics of expertise, reality, and safety, and so much more. His life and journey to date from the schoolboy dreams to where he's led him today in a successful career, someone who is one of the most inspiring individuals I've met. We are excited and pleased to welcome Mark Omrod, MBE, to our Diverse Talks. Mark Omrod has become an inspiration for many individuals from around the world. The challenges that have been faced that have had personal and community effects, yet how the life-changing incident has driven Mark to succeed in life despite many challenges that normal individuals would actually find just too much. On Christmas Eve 2007, while serving with the Royal Marine Commandos in Afghanistan, Mark was in an incident that changed his life and those around him, and those he loved and who loved him. Now, an inspiration to tens of thousands of individuals, an author, a motivational speaker, a fitness manic, owner of the brand No Limbics, a multiple gold medal winner at the Invictus Games, having been awarded the member of the British Empire, MBE, by the Queen, a father of three and a husband to one. We want to learn more about who is Mark Onward. Over to you, Mark. Guys, good morning from a very grey, wet and dreary <laughs> UK. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, where would you like me to start? Yeah, fantastic. It's great to have you here, Mark, to join us. You, you're, you're top of my list, and as you know, so despite your global success and the inspiration to thousands, as I mentioned, and the story that has led you to your life path and to where you are now, many will still not have heard. And the idea of this is to share that story. Uh, so you can inspire more and, and reach out more. Um, so on that basis, I'd really like to invite you to say a short 500-word essay. Describe, Mark Onward, what happened leading up to the event on Christmas Eve 2007. So the event itself, um, in the very shortest possible explanation... Um, I was three and a half months into a tour of Afghanistan, um, conducting multiple missions, bringing aid and security to the civilians that worked in the area, whilst also fighting off the enemy to try and bring some peace to the region. We were doing it very successfully. We had been out doing what we call dominating the ground, taking the fight to the enemy for those three and a half months. And then on Christmas Eve 2007, Whilst just out on a routine foot patrol, a uh, tragedy struck. And on the way back into the camp that we were working out of, Ford Operating Base Robinson, I stood on and detonated an improvised explosive device, which resulted in me losing both of my legs above the knee and my dominant right arm above the elbow. That's the quick version. <laughs> yeah, very, very quick, uh, and uh, there's much more leading into that. So let's step back a little bit in in the sense that that was a life-changing incident. Um, but what led you to be uh, before that? A little bit about your schoolboy dream of being a Royal Marine Commando, um, and then I know there's a bit of story there, so just share a little bit of that, and then we'll expand a little bit on the actual incident as well. It's really funny, actually, because... I now have a, my eldest daughter is just about to turn 16, she's just done her mock exams and this is pretty much where my story started, you know, I was 15 and a half years old, I had my final exams on the horizon to, to finish compulsory education and I just had this kind of epiphany that when those exams were over, I had to either go on to further education or to join the big bad world and get a job. So I kind of spent a few weeks trying to figure out what it was I wanted to do. You know, there, there was help on hand and all that. We weren't really connected online like we are now back then. So it was very much knocking on doors and asking questions and trying to figure things out for myself. But after a lot of soul searching, 
uh, and speaking to people, I decided that I wanted a career in the military. And after finding out I had an uncle who had served 22 years and left as a captain in the Royal Marines, I decided that that's the route I wanted to go down. And after more research, after speaking to the careers office, to the recruiting sergeant, reading the brochures and the pamphlets, watching the uh, the VHS cassettes, because DVDs weren't a thing back then, it just, you know, really affirmed for me that that was the path that I went to go down. Everything about it just seemed to connect with me and my personality and what I wanted to be and what I was about. So I set out on a career uh, in the Royal Marines when I was 16. I applied when I was 16, was fortunate enough to be accepted and to start my training when I was 17. And then I was very fortunate whilst going through training in that I never sustained any injuries and every two weeks going through that 32 week process I managed to make the grade pass the tests and get through that entire process in one hit so I had you know from 15 and a half of having the streamer joining applying at 16 starting training at 17 by the time I turned 18 I had gone through what is arguably the longest and hardest regular forces military training in the world and had a green beret on my head. You know, I had this symbol of an elite soldier and I was I was very young and ego-driven and uh, adrenaline fueled, ready to take on the world and spend what I thought was going to be 22 plus years traveling the world and, and living as a Royal Marines commando. Yeah, uh, that, that's fantastic. And, you know, that for me, that's an inspiration to the young kids of today as well. I know, I know they're very much different in mindset but what, what you did there from a, a schoolboy, you you targeted your dream, as I would call it, uh, and you followed that through to the end. So some of the traits you learned during the training of uh, to be a Royal Marine Commando, how has that carried forward into um, the, the, the business, the life of, once you got your Green Beret, what, what did you do then? Um, so initially, so, okay, I'll go back a little bit. I, I started my training in February, 2001 and it's back then it was 30 weeks. I think it's now 36 weeks, but I got through, like I said, in one hit, which brought us to October, 2001, which was four weeks after the whole world witnessed the tragedies of 9-11. So we knew straight away you know, before we'd even finished our training that once we did, we were going to be getting sent somewhere in the world to do this job that we just spent the last 30 plus weeks training to do, which as an 18 year old was very exciting. You know, you're you're young, you're stupid, you're naive, you think you're invincible. So I was just itching to get out there and put all these things that I'd learned into practice in the real world. And that's kind of what happened. You know, I, I passed out of training early 2002. I started pre-deployment training to go to Afghanistan on something that was called Operation Jakana. And disappointingly, after doing that training, they scaled back the deployment and loads of us didn't go. Uh, It became, I think, more of a special forces thing, uh, a lot of reconnaissance work and sneaky stuff that we weren't trained to do. So I kind of sat around in the UK, a little bit annoyed, a little bit deflated, waiting for that call. That call came about a year later, but for Iraq rather than Afghanistan. And then I was involved in early 2003 in that initial push over the Kuwaiti Iraqi border into Iraq. Personally, I was uh, deployed to a place called Umm Qasar, and a lot of my friends went up to the oil fields, to Saddam's palace, and, you know, did what we all watched over the news uh, in that area. Now, I didn't get very heavily involved in any of that which again was a little bit disappointing I I had trained and you know got myself in the mindset to to be at the pointy end of the spear but I didn't fire a single round that whole tour like three and a half months just got a really good suntan I got to see a place that I never thought I'd get to see and then came home you know so it was a little bit again deflated a little bit disappointed but on a plus side, in those first three, three and a half years of my career, I, I had done quite a lot. 
you know, I'd been through training at my Green Beret. At 19, I'd been to Iraq and experienced or, or experienced what I thought was was a war zone. You know, when I came back, I got to deploy to Norway and learned to, to fight and survive in Arctic conditions. I went on a exercise where I sailed, got to go on one of our naval ships down to Virginia and, and work with other branches of the military from around the world and uh, managed to squeeze a lot in. Got even boxed for a little bit as a heavyweight. I lost the Royal Marines heavyweight boxing final by one point, which I am sorely disappointed about, but had a, a great first five years of my career. I packed a lot in, got to meet a lot of people and, and experienced a lot of things that I'll, uh, I'll be forever grateful for. That's that's fantastic. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So in in your in as part of your recovery, when you identify that uh, um, you stepped on IED, and then what would be your challenge, um, you know, in in bringing yourself to where you are now in that process of recovery? Yeah, I mean, so fast forward from what I was saying just now, very very quickly. Um, after that first five years, I actually left the military because my daughter was born, failed miserably as a civilian, rejoined in 2007, went out to Afghanistan, um, which was a lot different to Iraq. I fired a lot of rounds <laughs> during that tour. But yeah, then tragically on, on Christmas Eve, stood on the improvised explosive device, lost three limbs, uh, was brought back from the dead and then had to start that recovery process. And in answer to your question, the most difficult thing for me, which I knew then and, and looking back still was the most difficult thing, was that I was actually the first triple amputee from the conflict. And if this information is right from what I was told, the first surviving triple amputee since the First World War. So my difficulty was that no one had trodden this path before and I had no one I could go to as a mentor so I had to figure it all out myself and you know I, I knew I needed a mentor from the beginning I knew if I wanted to succeed as quickly and as easily as possible I just had to find someone who had been there done it got the t-shirt and then get them to tell me how they did it but my biggest challenge was that that didn't exist in the UK and myself and my entire team were going to have to figure everything out from scratch and just face all these challenges in what was already going to be a difficult journey, but just try and face all these challenges as they come and, and figure them out as we went. Mm. I mean, this is a, a challenge question here. If you, that's something like you just described is, is quite uncomprehendable to so many people. Um, but you're in this position, triple amputee first, no real medical support available in that sense first time. It was learning, right? So you had to reach mm -hmm. out. But at any point of time, um, was there anything you said, what the heck, I just don't want to do it anymore and have that mindset of stop? Or was your commando training, your spirit of the commando training, was that the driving factor to keep you going? I'm not going to lie. Pretty much every day was like, I can't do this. I want to quit you know, especially in those early days when it is so overwhelming, you know, I was 24 years old. So it was so overwhelming trying to look at my life, look at my future, figure this out and blaze the trail as I went, because like I said, no one had ever done this before with the level of injury that I had. So it, it was frustrating. It was overwhelming. It was hard. But the commando training that you talked about is what I attribute to 90% of the, the success that I had. It was that commando mindset, you know, courage, determination, unselfishness, cheerfulness in the face of adversity. Knowing what I was capable of from going through that training as a 17-year-old, which, you know, I, I know you know, Darren, hundreds and thousands of people fail this year on year on year. People don't make the grade. We started with 62 people when I started my training back in 2001 and 16 of us passed. You know, the attrition rate's crazy, but I learned a lot about myself during that training. I learned what I was capable of. I learned the right kind of mindset and I learned that, you know, when things do get tough, that little voice in your head that says you need to stop, you need to quit, when that 
start speaking to you, you know, your body's only a probably 45 to 50% along that road to, to failing. You know, it's your mind you've got to overcome. And so I applied all those lessons from training to my rehab. And that's exactly how I looked at it. Yeah. And, and I think um, as well, you know, it's a, it's a, a mind, like you said, it's a mindset, but it's also a, a subconscious mindset because during the training, it's like embedded in what you do. It's embedded in your ethos, in your heart, your passion, everything, what you do. So then you brought it to more of a conscious mindset because you are in this position, you are in this tragic position and that's what drove you through to where you are today and I'm sure it still does um yeah and you know what I did as well is is I made it about more than me so I I thought there were times obviously when I'm focusing on just me you know and I'm feeling a little bit sorry for myself and I've got to do this and this is my goal but I remember specifically about four weeks into my recovery when I was laying in a hospital bed and I, I don't know what brought me to think of this, but the, the Royal Marines at the time, I believe, were 346 years old, potentially. It was coming up to the 350th birthday. And I remember lying in bed with not much else to do, thinking, you know, I've never heard of anybody that served in the Royal Marines through, you know, anything that's on the internet, anything I read in a book, anything I had been told going through training or by the Royal Marines. I'd never heard of anybody who had quit and was famous for letting the team down and you know not living up to those standards and and the morals and the mindset of a Royal Marine and I remember thinking I am not going to be that guy I'm not going to be the guy that gets remembered for facing adversity and going you know what I can't do this you know it's great to have a green beret on my head but it's just a bit of cloth and I don't live that that mindset and that drove me on you know, I thought I, I do live that mindset. That is me. I represent more than just me. I represent 350 plus years of elite Royal Marines history and I'm not like, going to let the side down. And that really drove me on when I got up in the mornings and I had to put my prosthetic legs on and my groin was cut, my back was sore, my legs were blistered and I had no energy, no motivation, no enthusiasm. You know, that was one of the big driving factors for me. It's yeah. very interesting. And, um, I mean, for me, cheerfulness in the face of adversity mm. is, the, is the one that carries me through in the sense of so many things, because it's probably the hardest to do as well. Yeah, that's true. Tell yeah. us about the Invictus Games. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is, I love telling this story because, um, you know, I, I find it funny, but when I was first injured, when I would meet new people, or even people that I knew, within like the first five or 10 minutes of of talking to them, people would generally say, so when are you going to start training for the Paralympics? Like it was some prerequisite to being disabled. Like if you're disabled, you have to be a Paralympian. And I'm like, I don't want to train for the Paralympics. I have no interest. You know, the sports don't interest me. The train don't interest me. It's not on my list of goals. You know, I, I don't want to do that. My main goal when I first got injured was to be independent of a wheelchair, to learn to master prosthetics and to live as much of my life as possible, and I'm talking 40, 50 years, without a wheelchair, without carers, without restrictions. So I had no ambitions at all of doing any sort of adaptive sport. Now in 2016, so what I do is every Christmas I'll sit down right where I am now, in my home office at this desk, and I'll start sketching out my list of goals for the following year. And in 2016, I realized Christmas Eve 2017 was going to be my 10-year, what we call our, our bang Um, It'd be 10 years post-injury. And I sat here and I started, you know, what I generally do is I, I list out the areas that are important to me. So family, fitness, finance, careers, personal development, all that kind of stuff. And I thought, what haven't I done in 10 years what would be a really nice way to mark this milestone? And I literally, right where I am now, sat on this chair, closed my eyes, and I started thinking. And this image of like a jigsaw puzzle came into my mind. And I, you know, had these pieces, which what I just said, you know, finance, family, fitness, health, and all that. And it was like the centerpiece was missing. So I sat here for about 15 minutes just thinking, what is missing? What haven't I done? And then it hit me, you know, sport, adaptive sport. I haven't done any of that. So maybe I'll give that a go. Now, the Invictus Games was two years old at this point. 
and I had seen a lot of my friends, a lot of the guys and girls that I went through rehab with who did focus on sport, go out there, win medals, which was great to see. But what impressed me more was where I'd seen them in rehab, you know, sometimes down, depressed, lost, no sense of purpose and, and no direction. I saw them change in, in that regards. And it, you know, it lit a fire under them and it gave them something to aim for and, and a focus. So I watched as the games went on and, and I thought it was great. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to set a goal of of trying to represent my country again, which is something I never thought I'd get to do in the Invictus Games. Now, I wasn't in any of those sporting cliques because like I said, sport wasn't a thing for me. It wasn't on my radar. So I, I thought I had no chance of getting in. I'd, I'd never done any of these sports before that were on offer. I didn't know anybody. Um, you know, I came in as a complete outsider, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to give it a go anyway. And so that's what I did. And and I was pretty lucky. You know, I, I managed to fight my way through the selection process. I managed to meet the criteria that they were after because it goes far, far beyond being athletic. And I, and I made the team. Um And that started what was supposed to be just a one-off, one-year, one event for me. Um, Ended up going into two years because I wasn't happy with my performance the first year. And yeah, led later on to 11 medals and the uh, Jaguar Land Rover Award for exceptional performance at the event. I'm just getting goosebumps just listening to that story. I think we both (laughs) are. I've had goosebumps so many times in this uh, this talk so far. It's fantastic. So what, what were your medal in? Um, don't say it was boxing, please. <laughs> no, um, it was uh, indoor rowing. So on a concept two rower, four minute sprint, one minute sprint. Swimming, 50 meter freestyle, 50 meter breaststroke, 100 meter freestyle, uh, shot putt, discus and hand cycling. Wow. I think many so, watching yeah. this would say, <laughs> how can you do that as a triple amputee? Honestly, uh, honest, and that's such an inspiration. That, you know, just the swimming aspect of it. I, I can't even do any of those above. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You just figure it out though, and you adapt. You know what I mean? There's so much support and help out there, and knowledge now, and and it's so easy to access with the internet and the coaches that were on hand that we just figured things out. And the funny thing is, you know, you say like as a triple amputee, how do you do that? The way I do it is completely different to the triple amputee sat on my left and it's completely different to the triple amputee sat on my right when we're racing because they have their own unique preferred ways to do anything, whether it is swimming, rowing or walking or interacting as a father, as a husband, as an an employee in a job, anything. We we all do it differently. On paper, we kind of look the same, but in reality, it's all just, you know, improvise, adapt and overcome. Yeah. And also that sincerity, you know, it's about you and it? it's about what you want to do. And when you mention about you sit down and write your goals, I think that's a fantastic uh, thing that everybody should be doing each year. And I know many of us say we do or want to do it, but we don't. So it's, it's getting into that mindset routine as well that, that drives us through to achievements like you've achieved. That's uh, absolutely, absolutely. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and, and the other addition is that you've learned, you've unlearned and you relearn you know, all about adapting. Yeah, I mean, when I first when I first started learning to walk again, I literally compared it to being a baby, but with 24 years experience. Then that's, that's what it was like. And, you know, this is such a corny analogy, but I used to say this to people and I used to think it, but when, when you are a baby, and it's exactly the same because I was learning to walk as an adult, when you're in your baby, you just, you know, you fall over, you giggle, you get up, you try again, you don't quit because when you're a baby, you don't know what quitting is. You just go, okay, that didn't work. I'll try something else. And you carry on, you carry on, you carry on. And then a couple of days, maybe weeks or months later, you're, you're tearing across the living room and your parents are running after you, stopping you, grabbing stuff. And it was the same in, it was the same in rehab. You know, I, I got up with prosthetics on, hit the deck, you know, got up and, and just kept on carrying on till eventually I was you know, running from one end of the room to the other, like when I was a child. With um, your nurse that's screaming behind you, stop it, Mark, you're going too fast. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay, I think that's a, a great, what we're going to do now is actually uh, finish this first session. There's so much more for us to talk about. 
So we're going to stop this first session and uh, please join us to follow up with the second session with Mark Onward. Thank you very much and see you soon.